it's great to be here and thank you so much for coming. Um, can I just, out of curiosity, ask um, how many of you come from what is still just the United Kingdom? <laughs> okay, right. That gives me a sense of audience. Um, this book begins with a Scot in a balloon. Um, the Scot is a guy called James Tickler, who managed the first balloon flight over Edinburgh fairly briefly in 1784 in a hot air balloon of his own design. Um, Tickler was a remarkable man, uh, a real enlightenment man, but he was also freaky um, on the margin. Uh, he eventually died in the United States when he fell in a pond under the influence of drink. Um, I hope, you know, it won't happen to me. Um, but uh, while I'm not an outsider of that sort, in a sense I am an outsider. Uh, I'm a, a mongrel, if you like. I'm part Welsh, part Irish. I was born in the north of England, and there's a big division between the north of England and the south of England, as some of you should know. Um, and as you've been told, I've spent most of my adult career on the east coast of the United States. So why did I write this book, Acts of Union and Disunion? Well, I partly wrote this book and the Radio 4 broadcasts on which it expands out of a belief that as an academic historian I could bring something rather different to the table, um, that, that I could deal with these issues with a historical sense that is often lacking. Um, and I really wrote the book in part with different audiences in mind. Um, I wrote it in, port, in part as a kind of guidebook for those who wanted in a small compressed compass um, a guide, a historically informed guide to how the current UK has emerged and some of the fault lines that characterised it at the present. Um, I do actually believe I suppose professionally I have an interest to believe, but I genuinely do believe that an appreciation of longer and deeper histories is needful if you want to understand the current state of the UK as a whole and its various fault lines. And I have to say, even though the UK is often talked about by some politicians as being quintessentially different from other EU countries. In fact, many of the challenges and difficulties and divisions that characterize the UK <coughs> have things in common with many other European nations. Now, it is, of course, the case that an exponentially rapid movement of capital ideas, migrants, information across continents, what passes for globalization in short, is posing challenges to the traditional ordering and integrity and customary <coughs> habits of all states. All states at the moment, virtually all states are having to deal with issues of identity and order consequent on what we know as globalization. Uh, and the sharpening identity issues in the UK have partly to be understood in this broad global framework. And I think that's important. But there are also more specific and historic factors involved in understanding the state the UK is in at present. <clears throat> The UK is what is known as a composite state. As are many other European states, Spain, for example. What is a composite state? It's a state made up 
of different countries and regions that were once independent or at least quasi-autonomous. Uh, and there's an awful lot of composite states in Europe and indeed elsewhere. India is a composite state, for example. How did the UK come to be what it is? Um, forgive me if you know this, uh, <coughs> many of you will, but for those of you who don't know, I'll run through it very quickly. There's a set of what are often called Acts of Union. In 1536 and the early 1540s, England and Wales are joined very much on London terms. Then in 1603, you get the Union of Crowns, which is in some ways very much a Scottish initiative. Uh, a Scottish monarch comes down <coughs> to the south. Uh, this is James VI. He becomes James I. He joins together the various kingdoms of Scotland, England and Wales, and Ireland. So this is the so-called Union of Crowns in 1603. But Scotland still retains its own parliament. And it does so until 1707, when you get the next stage in the jigsaw, the Act of Union or Treaty of Union, whereby Scotland loses its separate parliament at Edinburgh, at least for a while. Um, gets representation in the Westminster Parliament, but in many ways retains considerable autonomy even so. Scotland, even after 1707, retains its own church system, its own legal system, uh, its own educational systems. The next part of the jigsaw is the Act of Union with Ireland in 1800-1801, um, a fundamentally unsatisfactory arrangement, though it could have been much better, actually. And it was on the verge of actually being much better um, because the original Act of Union between Great Britain and Ireland gives Catholics parity politically with Protestants. And it's only King George III that puts his boot in, in his normally constructive way, um, that, that really gets in the way. And, and I mean, you know, if that had not happened, Anglo-Irish relations could have been quite different, in fact. Um, after the Act of Union with Ireland, you get what becomes the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland. And that is the system until the Irish Revolution, which breaks out, as many of you know, in 1916, goes on until basically 1922. Uh, Ireland splits. You get the creation of what ultimately becomes the Republic of Ireland. But the northern provinces of Ireland stay with Great Britain. And that gives you what? the name of the state currently is the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. But um, this is, as I say, a composite arrangement. It's worth noticing that most of these acts of union that link these different parts together, the different parts of the jigsaw, occur at times of war. War has helped cement the different parts of the current UK together. Conversely, in times of peace, there has often been growing friction between the different parts of the UK, particularly if it's protracted peace. Uh, and I stress this because it's often thought that current difficulties are recent, new. Um, well, no, actually, we've been there before. Um, at the end of the 19th century, after the protracted period of European peace, after Waterloo, you get 
growing fractures emerging in the UK, partly to do with Ireland, of course, but also you get home rule agitation in Scotland, in Wales, and in England. Uh, and before the First World War, there's a considerable movement in favour of what is called home rule all round. Support for a kind of federal system whereby England, Scotland, Wales and Ireland will all get considerable autonomy in a much more federal system. Uh, and of course there's still the massive British Empire at the time. And so some people envisage many layers of authority with an imperial parliament, uh, a Westminster Parliament overseeing the separate UK local parliaments or national parliaments in England, Wales, Scotland and Ireland. And one of the great what-ifs of history is obviously in many respects, not least in this country, what would have happened had the First World War not broken out in 1914? Because leading up to 1914, there was growing discussion in different parts of the UK of a much more federal system, of a possible written constitution. Ambitious young politicians like Winston Churchill were talking of a federal reorganisation of the UK, with England itself being divided into different parts. Churchill wants it divided into seven different parts so that you don't have this asymmetry between the size of England and the size of Wales and Scotland and Ireland. Um, but the First World War, uh, which of course cuts across so many things and so many human lives, also cuts across these constitutional uh, ideas and creativity. Um, and the gap between the First and Second World War is too brief for anything seriously to recover, though it's interesting that both the Welsh National Party and the Scottish National Party emerge in that brief period of peace between the First and Second World War, continuing this pattern of peace creating situations in which the political organisation of the UK starts being discussed again and thought about. In other words, if you look at this historically, which I think is frankly the only way to do it, um, you can arguably view the increasing number of demands for some kind of breakup or reorganisation of the UK which have grown increasingly loud really since the 1970s as a continuation of a pattern. We've had a substantial period of peace since the Second World War and so you start getting these discussions and arguments emerging again. There was a sense, I think, in which the two world wars of the 20th century placed a premium both on national in the sense of UK-wide union and on the centralising power of London. Mm. Protracted peace has increasingly permitted and fostered a questioning of both these things. But in addition, the 20th century witnessed a decline in many of the once powerful stories that helped not everybody but substantial numbers of people in the different parts of the UK to imagine a collective identity. What are the stories that have gone? And, and in the book I call them constitutive stories. Uh, all nations or would-be nations or would-be nation states or state nations have these kind of constitutive stories. Stories, myths that they tell about themselves. Uh, and they have to be believed in order for the cement to work. So what are the stories that have lost potency in the UK in recent decades? Protestantism is one. Um, 
Obviously, Protestantism was a divisive force uh, after the Reformation, but it was the case that the bulk of Scots, the bulk of the Welsh, the bulk of the English, uh, clearly the Unionist majority uh, in Northern Ireland were conscious of not just Protestant religion, but of Protestant culture. Uh, and that remained powerful until after the Second World War. And of course, it's now completely different. Uh, the culture in the UK has become much more secular, much more mixed. There have been immigration on the part of non-Christian religious groups. Um, there's a tapestry of religious belief and unbelief in the UK now. That Protestant cement has gone. Um, the cult of the sea and naval power, again, very powerful, um, has gone. Uh, so, of course, has the empire. Um, it is sometimes suggested that the empire was something peculiarly English, um, and that, you know, the English were hooked on empire to a particular degree. Um, sorry, um, uh, if you think, as many do, that empire was a sin, then the different component parts of the UK all committed it. Uh, and in fact, in terms of jobs, commercial deals, migration, um, the Scots and the Irish played a quite disproportionate part in the British Empire. Um, this was a powerful attraction and of course a powerful, um, while the empire existed, um, most people throughout the UK, not everybody, but most people thought it was a great thing um, and that was how it was. Uh, but there was also not only the kind of psychic satisfaction of empire, but empire gave jobs, empire gave opportunities, empire gave trade and deals and a sense of global grandeur. Empire was a powerful cement, but obviously it's gone. Constitutional complacency, a sense that the British political system was the best on the globe. That, again, was a powerful myth, constitutive story. Uh, when the UN Charter was put through in the late 1940s, the British representative to the UN, who was a Scot, said, the UN has finally adopted Magna Carta. <laughs> You know, here was this sense of Britain giving constitutional <laughs> lessons to the globe. Um, and, you know, we may grin, but, you know, that was a powerful notion. So, you know, one of the things that has happened, and it's happened quite rapidly, really increasingly since the 1960s and 70s, has been the decline, the attrition of these constitutive stories. And you could argue that the, perhaps the one powerful constitutive story that is still hanging on is the monarchy. Um, and I think it will be very interesting to see what happens when Elizabeth II finally dies. Because the astonishing length of her reign and remember, she inherited in 1952. The longevity of her reign has masked for some UK citizens the enormous degree of changes which they have otherwise <laughs> experienced. No state in the history of the world has lost territory so rapidly as the UK has done <laughs> since the Second World War. It's been a quite astonishing shift. But the longevity of the Queen uh, and her respectable persona has helped mask that. 
and it will be intriguing, um, and I don't mean this disrespectfully, to see what happens when she eventually dies. What I'm suggesting, therefore, is that I think it's quite inappropriate to see the recent Scottish referendum campaign and what led up to it as sui generis, um, as something that's just happening in Scotland. Of course, there are all kinds of distinctive Scottish issues and roots, but you could argue that Scottish separatist sentiment is also part of wider problems of identity and growing fissures and tensions within the UK. Because as I say, the UK is a composite state. It's a state nation, as some political scientists call it. Um, and to be effective, state nations require a two-level strategy. And that applies everywhere. There are many state nations. Um, what do you have to do to run an effective state nation, a composite net state? You have to operate at two levels. You've got to take action to keep the different component parts happy and content, catering to their respective autonomies and traditions. But you've also got to float and keep going some idea of union and why it should be rational and good. Uh, and what has increasingly happened, of course, is that that two-level strategy has proved increasingly difficult for London governments. Um, in other words, if you want a functioning union, you've got to keep some attractive idea of unionism in good repair. <laughs> and that has been a problem. And actually, it's a problem in some ways which the EU as a whole is suffering from. As the Pope pointed out <laughs> only a few days ago, that any kind of political union of different units You've got to keep the different units happy, but you've also got to think of a story, a narrative, as to why the union as a whole is rational and good and feasible. Uh, an attractive idea, not just economics, not just bits and bobs and technocrats, but an attractive, cogent idea, an ideal, if you like, a story. Um, and it may be that, you know, we've sort of moved beyond uh, these animating ideas, I don't know, at least as far as the UK is concerned. Um, I'm not one of those who think that the so-called breakup of Britain is necessarily predetermined. Um, as a historian, I don't believe that anything is predetermined. Uh, that's not how I see events developing. And in the last chapter of Acts of Union, I threw out various ideas of how perhaps one could make the system work rather better. Uh, one of the challenges I think that London has not been able to cope with um, is moving beyond ad hoc uh, responses. Um, they haven't really thought it through. There hasn't been a systematic reappraisal across the UK of what you might want to do. Uh, some people, of course, just want to break away, but some people don't. Um, and these issues need to be thought about systematically. So what did I think, um, if you like, doffing my historian's hat for a moment and um, just making some suggestions, and obviously I have no power whatsoever, but um, I can still make suggestions. Um, one of the things I think you have to do, um, 
and I realise the Scots in the audience here won't be particularly moved by this prospect, but I think <laughs> if you're going to keep the UK together at any level, you actually need to create an English parliament. Uh, in other words, the devolution measures of the 1990s um, created parliamentary institutions, quasi-parliamentary institutions, or approved them in <coughs> Scotland, in Wales, in Northern Ireland. But nothing was done in England. Uh, and I think that asymmetry uh, partly explains the rise of forms of <coughs> English nationalism, some of which UKIP is exploiting at the moment. Um, why not have an English parliament? Why not situate it in the north of England? Because actually the divide between the north and the south of England seems to me to be as fierce as the divide between the different countries of the UK. I mean, the standard of living in the north of England has been lower than the standard of living in the south of England since medieval times. Here is a real tension that needs to be addressed. So if you have an English parliament, why not situate it in the north? Um, and, uh, you know, sort out some of these tensions. Um, this should be part of a much more explicitly federal state. Uh, federalism, uh, of course you, you know about federalism here, um, <laughs> but um, it's, it's not part of normal UK political vocabulary very often and you know uh, I think the bullet has to be bit. Um, such a federal state would need some kind of codified constitution. Uh, I think frankly that's going to happen um, whatever goes on. I think the momentum in that direction is now very strong. Because what's clear is that increasingly the UK is confronting issues that it, it just has no experience of. Um, think about the referendum. Um, one of the things that many European countries and many non-European countries have in regard to referenda is they have rules in their written constitution as to what kind of majority is needed in a referendum to affect major political change. Uh, on the grounds that if something is really going to shake it up, you can't just do it on a majority of 50.1%. You've got to say it's got to be 60%. 65% or something, because otherwise, uh, with people not turning up to vote or with freaky economic circumstances, you may have massive change um, without, in fact, that much uh, supporting um, population. Um, but the UK has no written constitution, so it would have been possible, perhaps. Some of you think it was right, and I'm certainly happy to talk about that, for Scotland to have become an independent state on the basis of 50.01% of the people voting. Um, it's possible at the moment that the UK or parts of it could withdraw from the EU on the basis of 50.01% of those people who do decide to vote. Um, this is not the most sensible way to order things. Um, I think you need a constitutional convention. I think um, these issues have to be thought of because otherwise you get ad hoc constitutional measures rushed through by Westminster parliaments, often adjusted to the partisan interests of the political party dominant at the time and as a result, uh, these changes don't always command legitimacy. Uh, you need something much more systematic. I think many of the rules of UK politics 
of course, stem from an earlier time, uh, a time when voters were judged to be more deferential, a time when um, the political elites were much more homogenous, all white males educated in similar universities who'd read the same kind of books, uh, and there was a sense that everybody knows the system. So we don't need to write it down. And anyway, our political system is the best in the world, so why should we write it down? Others have to write it down, but they're not us. We know it. Um, uh, you know, this, this view was, was very prevalent. I mean, Edmund Burke's line on Magna Carta was that Ed, Magna Carta didn't need to be translated out of the Latin because everybody knew what it meant. Um, and, and, you know, here is the sense that it is no, we don't need to write it down. Um, that time has gone. Um, I'm going to stop pretty much here. I suspect there'll be lots of questions about recent events. Um, it's quite clear that the Scottish referendum has not brought closure. I never thought it would. Um, it's also clear that nobody's got a clue what the result of the general election next year in the UK is going to be. Uh, much hangs on that. Um, one of the s additional strains uh, happening in the UK, and again it's another respect in which in some ways it's becoming much more European, is that instead of the two-party political system uh, which is assumed to be the system that operates. Um, we're getting a multi-party system. Coalition governments are going to remain the norm for a long time, perhaps forever. Uh, and a lot depends on what coalition will be formed at the next general election. Um, if the Conservatives just scrape through to a majority but need allies and turn to UKIP, for allies, well, it's fairly clear what's going to happen after that. But on the other hand, Labour may just scrape through and align with the SNP and with the Greens, in which case there'll be no referendum on the EU, but relations within the UK will change far more radically. Um, and we honestly do not know what's going to happen. The final remark I would want to make stems from my experience of the United States and it actually applies, I think, to everyone in Europe and I count the UK as part of Europe. Um, I see um, in the United States, in the newspapers, in political statements made there, um, a growing sense that the United States is fed up with subsidizing Europe, with subsidizing disproportionately NATO. They've had enough. They feel that the European countries are rich enough to defend themselves. Um, actually, I think they're right. Um, and I think this is something when European countries talk about their respective nationality issues, their shades of identity. Uh, you have to remember the wider world too. This is a nasty, increasingly volatile world. So however much different <coughs> Europeans <coughs> fragment, we also have to work out ways of coming together and every European polity is going almost certainly in the future to have to pay more for defence. And that's going to have all kinds of repercussions for welfare policy that have hardly begun to be thought of. So with that happy thought. <laughs>